Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for October 16th, 2020. It's Friday, and that means it's Vault Certification Friday. We're going to be talking about the Vault Architecture Objective. I believe it's like Objective 9, and it's a very large objective. So this is part two of a multi-part series about the Vault Architecture. And in this one, we're going to be talking about the storage backend in Vault. Doesn't sound like it could be a whole video, but guess what it is. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get into the topic, I do have a few housekeeping items. One, HashiCorp Digital is over. Sad face, I know. We're all a little sad that it's over and done with. But there are some new product announcements that were pretty cool. There was Boundary and there was Waypoint. So I did a video on Boundary. I'll add a card in here somewhere for that. So if you want to check that out, totally do. Waypoint's not really in my uh, wheelhouse when it comes to things. But if you're a developer, this is totally up your alley. So definitely check those things out. The Vault Cert Guide is chugging along. I am on Objective 6 right now, which is the Vault CLI. So I'm working through that. If you want to purchase a copy as a, and watch as I write it, I believe I've published Objective 5. So that's out there in the world now. And Objective 6, I'm working on it, hoping to knock that out in the next week. So you can get that at Lean Pub, and I'll put a link down in the description. With that out of the way, let's check in. How you doing? Happy Friday. My goodness. It's it's been a week. I mean, every week I say that, right? It's been a week. Uh, but this one, it's yet another week. How about that? But it was, it's like it, today was pretty good. A little rainy, a little rainy. I, I went out for a run and I got um, drenched as will happen. But hopefully you had a slightly better experience today. Maybe you, uh, you got out for a run or a bike or, you know, just a walk and it was pleasant and sunny wherever you are because it was not here. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this whole vault storage backend. So last week, I talked about the general structure of Vault, and we talked about how there's a barrier in Vault. And on one side, you have the client, and everything goes through the API front end, whether you're using the Vault CLI or the UI or directly the API, all that goes through the API and then through the translation layer that lets it into the barrier. And then on the other side, you have the storage backend that connects to the back of the barrier. Everything in the barrier is not encrypted, but once it leaves the bar barrier, it will be encrypted in some way. And so the master encryption key is being used to encrypt data that goes out to the storage backend. So the thing, the first thing you need to know about the storage backend is that itself, the storage backend itself, does not need to natively support any kind of encryption because Vault is taking care of that for you. Could you also encrypt the data on the back end? Totally, you could do that, but there's no real security enhancement there because the data that's being written to disk or wherever it's, or database or wherever, that's already encrypted. So if you want to save yourself some cycles, you don't have to enable encryption on the storage itself because Vault's got you covered. Okay, so that's an important thing to know. Just a general tip. I don't know if that'll come up on the exam, but it is good to know. Now, what should the storage do? Well, it should be durable which means, you know, if something goes wrong, if a hard drive dies or whatever, your data is not lost. So it needs to be durable. You may also want it to be replicated. So if something happens, you know, if you're using, say, S3 and, you know, your bucket dies in one region, you have it replicated to another region or something along those lines. So it's recoverable. You should probably be backing it up so you can recover a previous version if something were to happen to the existing data in your storage backend. So basically all the things that you would expect from storage is going to be provided by that storage backend. Now, what are your options when it comes to the storage backend? Well, if you spin up the dev server, you're using the in-memory option. And that's really your only option for the dev server. And unfortunately with in-memory, as soon as you kill the process for the dev server, that information is gone. But that's the point. It's for development. So you wouldn't use the in-memory storage option for pretty much anything else, but that is certainly there. And then one of the most basics is file system. So you can just tell it to write the data to the file system on the compute object it's running on, whether that's a container or a virtual machine or a bare metal server, it can just write directly to a file system and you can use that. And that file system, it could be an NFS mount, it could be you know whatever you want, but the file system is absolutely an option for you. Going beyond that, let's talk about some other backend storage types. All right, so uh, object storage. 
is an option. So if you like to use object-based storage, you could put it in S3, you could put it in Azure storage, or you could use Google Cloud's cloud storage and use any of those and it's just object-based storage. You could use a relational database. So you could use Microsoft SQL, you could use MySQL, you could use Postgres. I believe that's also a, an official like RDB, uh, a relational database. So you could use any of those and that'll provide a higher level of consistency probably than a traditional file system. And you know, there's replication stuff that's built into those database management systems. So that's pretty cool. You can also use a NoSQL system, something like DynamoDB or Cassandra or CockroachDB. Any of those are absolutely options. All of the cloud service versions of NoSQL, those are all pretty much supported. You could use a distributed system, something like Zookeeper or etcd. And that's just a basic key value store. And usually those have some sort of replication and high availability component to them. Beyond that, you could use console. So another HashiCorp product, it absolutely supports Vault. And for a long time, that was their recommended storage backend was to use console because console was officially supported by HashiCorp and it was one of their internal products and it supported high availability, which gets me into the two things that you'll see when you're looking at the various storage options on the official documentation. It'll say whether or not it, whether it's HashiCorp supported or community supported. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means that the HashiCorp supported stuff, HashiCorp's responsible for actually writing and maintaining the bits that interact with that storage backend. The community supported, eh, it might be someone from HashiCorp, but it might not. And if you call in with a support issue, if you're using official, if you're actually paying for licensing and support from, uh, from HashiCorp for the enterprise version of Vault, you, they're gonna want you on a supported platform. So just remember, if you're using a community one that's maintained by the community, your mileage may vary depending on the implementation. So that's one important data point when you're looking at the storage options. The second important data point is high availability. So if you are running Vault Server in a production scenario and you need high availability to go along with your Vault cluster because you can create a cluster of Vault servers that understand high availability, only one of those servers is active at any given time. But if something happens to that server, one of the other servers has to take over and become the active server in the cluster. The storage backend is a shared storage backend, usually that supports high availability. And there's some sort of locking mechanism that lets the server know that it's available to write data to that data store and mount it as opposed to the previously active server. There's a lot to get into there and we're actually gonna cover clustering in next weeks. So I'm not gonna dive into the clustering aspect of things too much in replication. I do just wanna to touch on the fact that high availability basically supports clustering. Now there is one more storage option that I haven't talked about yet and it was introduced in Vault 1.4 and that's their integrated storage option. And just like it sounds, as opposed to relying on some other storage backend, it uses its own internal integrated storage backend. Now, it actually is using the file system underneath to write the data out, so you still need to provide it somewhere to write data, but each vault, it supports high availability, and each vault server in the cluster has a full copy of the data store, and it's replicated using the Raft consensus algorithm. I believe that's actually what console uses as well. So it leads me to think they repurposed the console bits and just sort of packaged them into Vault for this integrated storage. The really nice thing is now you don't have to set up a completely separate Vault cluster, I'm sorry, a completely separate console cluster for your storage and then integrate Vault with that console cluster. Now you can just enable integrated storage on your Vault cluster and you now have highly available storage that is officially supported by HashiCorp, and that's kind of nice. So that's how, you, those are all the different storage backend options, and you should be broadly aware of what they are and some of the trade-offs there, especially high availability and community versus HashiCorp supported for the certification. The other thing you need to know is how do you actually configure 
which storage backend to use. And that is done within the vault server configuration, which is usually an HCL file that has your vault server config in there. In there, there are multiple stanzas, and one of them is a storage stanza. And the stanza is basically storage, the type of storage you're going to use, a little curly brace, and then the, all the information you need about actually connecting to that storage back, back end. And those values can either be in the stanza or they can also be provided through environment variables at boot up. So if you're using something like Azure storage for the back end, you can supply all the values for Azure storage through environment variables instead of putting it in that configuration stanza. So uh, that covers the storage back end, and that's, uh, wow, we went a little over time. So I told you that storage was gonna be more interesting than you might have thought. We really, we got down the weeds a little bit, but I think if I had to summarize it, the things you really need to know about storage is the high availability, you need to understand the HashiCorp versus community supported, you need to understand the most common storage types, the in-memory, file, cloud-based, and the new uh, vault integrated storage options, and then how you actually configure that storage within the vault server configuration file. And that's it. Those are the things that I would recommend knowing. So that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, please share and subscribe. That does it for me for the week. I will be back on Monday with the best career advice ever with Holly Lehman. So stay tuned for that. Until then, stay healthy and stay safe out there.